Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning. We're glad that you folks chose to turn your clocks ahead and join us this morning. We're here to worship the Lord, and we're going to begin our service this morning by reading Psalm 86, as we usually do. We'll call it, make, we've entitled it a call to worship, and that's just to stimulate our hearts as we begin to worship the Lord today. And so I'd invite you to stand if you can and read Psalm 86. If you can't stand, perfectly understand, because Graham's probably going to make you stand the whole service anyway. So, <laughs> Anyway, so <laughs> made fun of you last week, made fun of you this week. I got a broad shoulder. You got a broad shoulder. <laughs> I'm just glad you still came back. Thank you. Psalm 86, I'll, I'll begin with reading the title, and you can read from there. Psalm 86 is a prayer of David. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto thee, O Lord, for I cry unto thee. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend unto the voice of my supplication. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations without faith shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, shall glorify For thou art great, and doest wondrous things, Thou art God alone. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of the violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. O oh, turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save, save the son of thy handmaid. Trust God's blessing to the reading of his word, and Grant's going to come now and lead us in some singing. Just remain standing. We're going to sing uh, from the chorus book, hymn number 15, There is a Redeemer.
Brother Hill's coming up now for prayer, and then the pastor will have some announcements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. And as we've just been singing, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And we pray, Lord, help us to appreciate that. Help us to walk in a way that honors you. And we just thank you, Lord, for each one who's come out today. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts will be enriched through your word and encouraged and, and sent out to, to do your will wherever you call us to go. We pray, too, for Pastor as he gives a word that you'll speak to our hearts through him and through the word and that we might really tune in with you and, and want to learn of you and to do what your will. We thank you, Lord, for these songs that remind us of our praise to you and thanksgiving for our salvation, the fact that you took the time for us. Help us to take time for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carol. If you have your bulletins, please, for just for some, go over some quick announcements. We do want to welcome you to Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship's hour, worship hour this morning, and we're glad you have chosen to fellowship and worship together with us. We will be having another opportunity again tonight at 6 p.m., and tonight in our evening service at 6, we'll be taking up the privilege of looking at Joshua 3, 4, and 5 again. We started looking at it back a few weeks ago, but we only got as far as through Joshua chapter 3. Uh, Lord willing, tonight we'll look at 4, and if allowed, able, we'll look at 5. Uh, from the aspect of a victorious Christian living. The last time we saw Joshua chapter 3, we saw the need for sanctification. If we're going to live a, a victorious Christian life, then it begins, it doesn't necessarily begin, but it is essential that we set apart ourselves for God. Sanctification. And we'll look at another need tonight, Lord willing. Next Sunday, we have the wonderful privilege of having Kevin McDonald from Fredericton, who's going to be ministering the Word of God, both, as I understand, in the morning and the evening service. Kevin is a gentleman who is a brother in the Lord who, came, who joined us for our trip to Jamaica when we were building Pastor Lloyd Collins' house in Jamaica. And so we'll be glad to have him back with us. Uh, this Wednesday morning, Lord willing, the deacons will be meeting together. So a reminder to the deacons that this Monday, uh, or the, excuse me, this Wednesday morning will be our deacons meeting at 9.30 a.m. Also Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we're going to be continuing our look at the book of Haggai. And we're going to be looking at the fourth and final message, I believe, in the book of Haggai, from Haggai chapter 2 at 7 p.m. Grief shares on tomorrow night. Beth Bolecki is going to be with us on Wednesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. So a reminder about that. And of course, we've just booked Creation Ministries International to be with us Friday, April 14th. Mark your calendars, invite a friend, plan to come and discover that the Bible and science really do agree. At 5.30 p.m. we'll have served pizza and the sessions will be at 6.30 p.m. And the sessions on that night will be How Do You Know Who Was There? And at 7.45, we'll be looking at another discussion, our family tree. Thomas Bailey will be our speaker. There will be a sign-up sheet for the registration as we grow closer to the event. If you plan to come, please register so we know how much pizza to purchase. There will be a registration sheet posted uh, closer to the event. And then something else that has just been added to that, we will be looking for people to help provide childcare so that families can come. So if you would be willing to help Please see myself after the morning service, or you can talk to my wife because we do want to have childcare available that evening so that everyone can come as well. And the pastor has booked a site at the August flea market. Again, if you have any general household items or gardening um, items that you would like to donate for the purpose of sharing the gospel or would like to help, then please come talk to me. And I received notification. I've, they've been giving me the site, um, the tape, the on the flea market grounds, and so I have that posted in my office. And so all the need left is to pray about it and then start gathering items for the flea market. And we will be looking for some gospel tracts as well to pass out with all the items that people want. I believe at this time that that's all the announcements at this. Something was telling me I had something else in the back of my mind, but it's not coming to me right away. And so, Graham, would you come and lead us in some more singing? And if something comes back to my mind, I'll interrupt you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's, uh, we'll sit down, <coughs> excuse me, we'll sit down for this one here, but I'm going to get you to stand up after this. Singing uh, hymn number 73 in the chorus book, He is Lord.
John Dewan coming up and he's going to be reading from James chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. James 2, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 1 to 11. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. <coughs> Excuse me. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And God has promised to bless the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to sing hymn number eight, uh, To God Be the Glory. As you know, sometimes I have, I like to just sort of uh, troll the internet. 
uh, for good, some good things to listen to. And as I've mentioned before, I have come across a wonderful church in California, Lancaster Baptist Church, by uh, Dr. Paul, Ch he's past the pastor's Dr. Paul Chapel, and connected with Lancaster Baptist Church's West Coast Bible College. And they have a wonderful selection of some beautiful music. And I, I just came across another one this week. And I just thought I'd share it with you to bless your heart, hopefully, and uh, as we just listen to the Word of God momentarily.
That's what we want today. We want God to get the glory. That's the purpose for our creation. That's the purpose for our existence and gathering together, that God may be glorified. And one of the things I think we need to realize is this. If God cannot get glory out of our lives, he will get glory out of our death. But one way or another, God will be glorified. And we hope that he will be glorified with our lives, and we hope that he'll be glorified with our gathering together as we worship his name together and look into his word to see what he has to say to us today. I want you to begin this morning by turning to the book of Daniel chapter 2, please. The book of Daniel chapter 2, as we just begin our worship time by listening to the voice of God. Daniel chapter 2. When you get to Daniel chapter 2, go down to verse 31. Verse 31. Verse 31 says this. Thou, O king, Daniel is interpreting a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he tells him the dream in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a a stone was cut cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces." Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it, be, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes of part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings, the kings of the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it break in pieces the iron and the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, And the interpretation thereof is sure. Now I want you to turn over to the book of Revelation chapter 18, please. Book of Revelation chapter 18. Verse 1 says of Revelation chapter 18, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. 
And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and of silver and of precious stones and of pearls and fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet and all thigh and wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. The fruits that thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which are made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many trade by sea stood afar off. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein thou were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Let's pause there for a word of prayer, shall we please? Father in heaven, we do come before you this morning, and <clears throat> we know, Lord, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have given considerable time to reading the word of God today, and Lord, you know, we have tried to establish the pattern of beginning our service with a, an Old Testament psalm, reading a New Testament epistle, because that's the letter to the churches, and then, Lord, we spend considerable time studying and reading through thy word together, especially here in the book of Revelation. And so we have tried to saturate the, word of God, the, the service today with the word of God because that really is sufficient. And we know, dear Holy Spirit, that you're able to take the word of God and teach us and instruct us and work and move in our hearts and our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you would do that. But Father, now as, as I prepare to share some thoughts, as I have studied this particular passage of Scripture, some thoughts that I believe this, of what this passage is speak, speaking about, Lord, I pray your blessing. I pray that you'd be, help me to be careful of the things I say and the manner in which I say it. But I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to preach thy word of God, whether it steps on toes or not. So, Father, we look to you and we ask, Lord, for your wisdom and direction. We ask, dear Holy Spirit, that you guide us and direct us into all truth. and Bring these things to our remembrance so that as we talk to men, we'll be able to open the word of God and show them how the word of God talks of these things going on. We thank you, Lord, that what we read in Revelation chapter 18 ultimately in some form is the fulfillment of what we just read in Daniel chapter 2. 
the destruction of world commercialism, the destruction of the world empires, and the setting up of a new kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, Christ's kingdom. But until that day comes, Lord, you have given us a responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Help us, Lord, not to be ashamed. Help us not to be afraid. Help us to preach the word of God until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen. We have here before us what we believe to be the destruction of Revelation, or excuse me, the destruction of the revived Roman Empire led by the Antichrist. We have called it in Revelation chapter 18, the destruction of the mercantile Babylon, the mercantile headquarters of the world. And I read um, Daniel chapter 2 because Daniel chapter 2 is the ending of the world empire, the destruction of the revived Roman Empire as symbolized in the Ted Toes. That basically is what happens here. But also you notice it referred to Babylon as the head of gold, that place of wealth, that, that place that made merchandise. And Babylon is here referenced again, and, and there are many people who believe, and I, I'm still sitting on the fence, but the more I read this passage of Scripture, it seems to imply that, that the ancient city of Babylon is going to be rebuilt and become the mercantile headquarters of the world. I don't know how, I don't know when, but the, it seems to, to believe it, and I, I just believe what the Word of God has to say. And I think it's important that we understand this. I believe it's important that we also begin to understand this, that the world's monetary system, Although physically we need money to survive, to pay our bills, we need to set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Because you can have all of the world's earthly goods, but if you don't have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have nothing. What shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what, one thing I know for sure is here in Revelation chapter 18 is we're talking about merchandise, 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 merchandise. The subject of Revelation chapter 18 is a city of merchandise whereby the nations and the kings and the merchants of the world have made rich and it all falls to pieces and then everybody mourns. We need to make sure of that. And we, 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 we gave a, a, a lengthy introduction already. So I, I, and the scriptures are replete of, of how Babylon is supposed to face a final destruction someday. And we saw that in Isaiah chapter 13, in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, and, and many portions of the Old Testament. But today I just want to look at now the, the chapter as it pertains to the destruction of mercantile Babylon. We started looking at it the last time, back a few weeks ago, about the promise that was given. And the promise is basically this, and we see that in verse 2. Look at this. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Here we see the promise, and the promise is simply this, Babylon will fall. This mercantile headquarters of the world, the, 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 the headquarters of the, the monetary system in the end times is going to fall and Babylon the city it will fall it is repeated for emphasis and so we have the promise it is going to happen Babylon the great is fallen and it is fallen it's repeated for emphasis it is written as if it has already happened it has been decreed by God and nothing is going to stop it nothing is going to stop it and we need to pay attention to this the promise is given. God hath declared and God has decreed it's going to happen. He gave forth a promise, it's going to fall. And we notice also, too, real quickly, we notice the inhabitants. Look at the inhabitants that will inhabit Babylon. It's, it has become the habitation of devils. Now, I don't quite know exactly how that's going to manifest itself, but here's what I know this. The closer we get to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his church, the worse this world is going to get. It's going to become very demonic. And young people, I just want to challenge you. Older people, be careful of the games you play. Be careful of this uh, Ouija boards. 
I remember my dad, I've probably told you this many times before, but I remember my dad telling a story one time when he was in, pastoring in New Glasgow. There was a, a group of young ladies from the town of Trenton, which was a, a town just right beside, the, going from New Glasgow to Trenton, like going from Sussex to Sussex Corner, that's how close it was. But it, there was a clear mark on the side of the road, you, you enter from New Glasgow to Trenton, and there's a group of young girls that were having some fun with a Ouija board one day. And they were up in the attic of their house, and they were playing this game, and they were having all kinds of fun until strange things started to happen. And things started flying around the room. And, and then one day they made a decision, this is just too weird, we're going to get rid of this Ouija board. And they physically tried to remove the Ouija board from the house, and they could not get rid of the Ouija board. Something was stopping them and interfering them. And somehow they came, found out about my dad, and they went into his, came to my dad in Glasgow, and they said, Pastor David, again, I don't know the circumstances around it. I was just a little kid, but I remember my dad telling the story. I had to physically go into the house and remove the Ouija board because they were not physically able to remove the Ouija board. What I'm saying is this. These things are not a game, and we need to be careful. Uh, this whole idea of hypnosis and, and stuff like this, you need to be very, very careful of this. We see this more and more... Um, promulgated on our televisions with demons and, and witchcrafts and things like that. And my friends, you need to be careful with that. Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. She has become the habitation of devils. And I'm just, I, just, I just use this to, to warn you. It's become the habitation of devils and foul spirits and unclean birds and hateful birds. And you need to be careful that this stuff is not a game. And I don't know if you've ever played with it, but if you have, you need to stay as far away from it as possible. That's why we need to be careful also about the hallucinatic drugs that they, they give us. They open doors, and once certain doors get opened, they're awfully hard to close. This promise is given for a city with the inhabitants who have become devils and foul spirits and unclean and hateful birds. But notice also the intoxicating influence this city has. Verse 3 says this, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Theodore H. Epp has written this, The, the world's great commercial center during the tribulation will have an intoxicating influence. All the nations will drink the wine of her unfaithfulness. A godless commercialism will exist in Babylon and it will be the world center of ill-gotten and deceitful business. And so God promises with regards to this city of Babylon, he makes the promise that Babylon will fall. Not only do we have the promise stated about the fall of Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, but I want you to notice, secondly, the plea that comes from God. The plea, verse 4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The plea from God in the midst of this, and the plea that is extended in this chapter there, talks about the downfall of Babylon, this place that's going to be inhabited by demons and devils and unclean birds that's going to have an intoxicating influence over the world. The plea is this, the people of God should come out. I want you to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I probably touched on this the last time, but I don't think we got much further. But I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. When you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I just checked to make sure your fingers are working this morning. You need to do your finger exercises. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. And again, I would remind young Christians, teenagers, older people, if you are a Christian and you name the name of Jesus Christ, you need to pay attention to verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? For what, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Can I just pause here for a second? That, that touch not the unclean thing. I just want to draw a parallel, because we're looking at Joshua chapters 3, 4, and 5. We're not, we're not going to get into it tonight, but Joshua chapter 6 is about the, the destruction of... Yeah, I think maybe I'll just stand behind the pulpit and not walk. Joshua chapter 6 is about the destruction of Jericho. Joshua chapter 7 is about the sin at, and the defeat at, at Ai. And we learn about the, the sin of Achan. The sin of Achan was when, he went, when they went into Jericho, he saw the wealth and some nice garments there, and he took the, the gold and the silver and, the, and the, some garments, and it brought about the defeat of the nation, and people died because he chose to touch the unclean things. Now, I'm not saying all money is evil, but if your pursuit and desire is all about money, you, you've got a problem. I remember when I was in high school, because I was raised in a, in, a, in a pastor's home, I was going to get a job. My whole pursuit of a job was what pays me the most money. And that's how I chose my, curric chose my curriculum. That's what I, what I was going to be a doctor or something, because I wanted to make all kinds of money. And God had to break me of that before I was willing to submit to him. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with having money. But if it's your pursuit and your desire, that is wrong, because God is to be our desire. Because God is to get the glory out of our life. And we're told here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I want you to turn over to 1 John chapter 2. What am I saying? I'm saying be careful of why you do what you do. I'm saying be careful of the, the influence of wealth and riches in this world. Be careful of the influences of this world because this world wants to lure you away from God and not draw you closer to God. John's been doing an, uh, an excellent study, uh, and I, I'm sure everyone, Jake has been doing an excellent study, and I know Kathy's been doing an excellent study, but I've been listening to John the last few weeks, and John's been talking about drawing nigh to God. And the influence and the desires of this world are not going to draw us closer to God, but the word of God and the things of God will draw us closer to him. And we need things that will take us away from the world and draw us closer to Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, we read this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father um, is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lusts are of, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We need to be careful. Turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 simply says, As ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God. Whosoever that will therefore be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now again, it's not saying there's anything wrong with having money. But if the money has you, there's a problem. If your pursuit is about having things, you've got a problem. Our pursuit should be God. And he warns us in Scripture to be careful of these things because they'll draw you in and they'll take you down a dark road and what's at the end of that dark road is demons and demonic activity and no good thing. And we need to be careful. And so God promises that he's going to destroy it and so he pleads with us, stay away from it, be careful of it because it'll suck you in and ruin your life. We're too involved in the affairs of this world God says for us to come out from among them and be ye separate. Don't isolate yourself. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel, but don't let the world be so influence your life that you forget about what God has called you to do and that your life exists now for the glory of God. Not to us, but to thine be the glory. That's the point of it all. It's realizing that I live for God. Because if I don't live for God, I'm going to live for something else that will destroy my life. 
And so we have a plea here. Notice, notice what he says here in verse 4. Turning back to, to James, uh, Revelation chapter 18. Oh my. He pleads for us to come out because this, look at verse 4. I heard another voice saying in heaven, come out of her for her sins that she received not her, of her plagues. Why should we come out from her? Because she is plagued. The word plague is a blow, a stripe, a wound, a public calamity, heavily affliction, and it's a plague. So we should come out from her because she is plagued. This world is condemned. This world is under the judgment of God. But if we've received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, he's not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And so be careful how much we get involved. She's plagued. She's polluted with sins. Look at verse 5. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This morning I wrote inside of my Bible, her sins have reached to heaven. How ironic, because the first time I read of the city of Babel, she tried to build a tower that would reach to heaven. And God cursed it and stopped it. She didn't build a tower that reached to heaven, but her sins have definitely reached to heaven. So she's plagued, she's polluted with sins, she's proud. And God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's why we need to be careful. So there's a promise. Babylon the, the great has fallen, has fallen. The promise is it's going to fall. It's going to collapse. And so our hope and our trust needs to be in Jesus Christ. And so he pleads with us in Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out from among them and be separate. Going down to verse 9. I want you to notice real quickly the partners. The partners and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication, who have lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn. Her partners with Babylon, the kings of the earth and merchants. Notice real quickly the products of this city. Someone has said this, there are 28 things listed in verses 12 to 14. The list here in these verses, in verses 12 to 14, that talk about the, par- the, the products that the partners were involved with in Babylon, the list here in these verses is quite a list. No wonder we are told that you are not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. The Antichrist will control the world's gross national product. We can understand why the partners cry when they see the the city go up in smoke in verses 15 to 17. The wealth of the world during this time will be centered in Babylon, and in one hour it will be destroyed. How is the luxury of today's world affecting us? What is your attitude toward it? Are you just going along with it? Each Christian needs to examine his heart in these matters. What have you set your heart on? Are you hoarding for just another day or do you recognize that we are living in the end times when all we have hoarded may be completely lost? The Bible warns, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. All these products. Now I want you to notice one more product here. I want you to look at verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants uh, uh, were the great men of the earth, for by thy, what's that next word? Sorceries. Can I remind you what that word is translated from? It's the Greek word pharmakia from which we get our word pharmacy. It's talking about drugs. I find it very interesting that when it comes to the last times, something that is highlighted is the use of drugs in a Greek word that is called pharmakia. Dennis Lyle, who preached a message and who I've listened to back in 2004, he asks the question, is the Antichrist going to legalize drugs? Will marijuana, cocaine, 
be legalized and sold through government-regulated businesses. And he preached that back in 2004. We live now in a day and age where these things are legalized and they're constantly talking more and more about legalization. One thing that we have learned over the last few years is that the pharma pharmaceutical companies have gotten rich off of the world. And they have been pushing um, vaccines and pharmaceutical drugs out their ears. And folks, I think we need to be careful. When they start telling you you can't work unless you get this shot, when they start telling you you can't do this or you can't buy or, or go there without this shot, there's something going on behind the scenes. I think you need to pay attention. I'm not trying to create a, a fuss here, but I'm saying you better start paying attention. And I, and I believe that this word pharma, pharmakia, this drugs, for by, the drugs were, for by thy drugs were all nations deceived. I think we need to pay attention to that. I want you to turn back to Proverbs chapter 23. Now I'm really going to step on toes. There is a growing trend in Christianity that is not good. And this growing trend is about the uh, use of alcohol. Proverbs 23, verse 29 says this. Verse 20 says this, Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Go down to verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who has wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look at verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Do you see that little phrase, when it moveth itself aright? That's referring to the agitation, the fermentation process. So in the Bible, it talks about wine when it says this, when it starts to move itself, when it starts to ferment, whereby it can become intoxicating and affect your, and influence you, you, look not upon it, you stay away from it. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When, I, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. I think there's more to the use of this sorcery than what you realize. And I think as Christians, we need to use some wisdom and be very, very careful. Whether it be the use of drugs or alcohol we're buying into the world's lies, we need to be very, very careful. That's the products. My friends, be very, very careful. Look at verse 20, going back to Revelation chapter 18. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. I call this the party. God calls for rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon. This city began with Nimrod in Genesis 10 and the Tower of Babel. It has continually stood as a place that has defied the living God, tried to imitate his plan and purposes, and it will one day be no more. I don't know where you stand today with God, but here's what I know. The scriptures are filled with people who have tried to bypass God, live as though he does not exist, nor will have to stand before him someday. But you will. In the beginning, God created, and in the end, God, there will be God. So why not today come to God and confess your need of a Savior? 
Turn to him while it is called today and call upon him for forgiveness. Jesus died, shed his blood, and rose again from the grave the third day for you. Receive him now before it's too late. And there's one more thing I want to share with you and then we'll be finished. The picture. The picture in verses 21 to 24. The destruction of Babylon with the use of a stone. God in his wisdom paints a picture for us of the destruction of the mercantile headwaters, commercial Babylon, revealing to us the suddenness of its downfall, the soberness, somberness of its downfall. Revelation 18 clarifies the method of Babylon's destruction described in Revelation 16 when the seventh vial of God's wrath is poured out. However, chapter 18, verse 21, gives us more details as to how this takes place. A great stone falls upon the city. The earth opens up, and with the great stone, Babylon sinks into the earth. We are told that the underground of the city of Babylon is kind of a burning asphalt. As the earthquake breaks the earth's crust, the city, like a millstone, will sink below the earth's surface and completely disappear. Nothing will be salvaged from the city, nor will stone be left which can be used for building other cities. The great millstone of Revelation 18 is a reminder of another great stone in Scripture, referring to the coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. When the fifth seal was opened, the martyrs who were seen under the altar were crying out for their blood to be avenged on those who dwell on the earth. They were told to rest a while longer and until other believers joined them in death. With the destruction of Babylon, this time has been fulfilled, and now the blood of martyred saints will be avenged. My friends, we need to take the things that are written in Revelation chapter 18 seriously. You may not like all the things that are mentioned there, but you need to apply your hearts to wisdom. We need to be careful. We need to be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And these things are alive and well. And we see these things forming all around us, and the mentality forming all around us. We must make sure that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. We must understand that we have a responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we must keep ourselves unspotted in the flesh and be careful that we don't fall into the world's devices or traps. Father in heaven, we come before you and we realize, Lord, that what we have here in Revelation chapter 18 is a somber note and a warning to us to be careful. It is an expectant note to be ready and I pray, Lord, that we'll keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, this world is headed for disaster. But you're not willing that any should perish. As we read these things and discover some truths, and Lord, all we really did was just scratch the surface. Because there's so much more we could have delved into in this passage of Scripture. But time does not always allow. And so I pray to your Holy Spirit that you would work and move in hearts and lives that you would convince us not of my truths, but of thy truths. And that, Lord, that we will seek to follow you. So we pray, Lord, that you be honored and glorified with our lives through this time that we spend together and the rest of this day. And, Lord, help us to live for you, not for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to take your hymn books, please, and stand and just sing in closing number 341. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day. I don't know about tomorrow, I just live from day to day.
and we can discuss and know all the plans about the future. But the question we need to ask ourselves today is this. Today, is Jesus Christ my Savior? Today, am I living for Him? Those are the questions you need to answer today. And if you can't answer them right now, we'd love to sit down and be able to talk with you and share with you and show you how you can know for sure. Your sins are forgiven. I'm guaranteed a place in heaven. We want to show you how you can know for sure that you're following Jesus Christ. But the choice is yours. Will you choose him or will you choose the pathway of the world? Father, dismiss us now with thy blessing. Dear Holy Spirit, I ask that you would be our conviction, our conscience, our guide, and our stay. In Jesus' name, amen.